everyone, welcome to the next episode of my science podcast. Today I am absolutely delighted to welcome Dame Janet Thornton, who is the director of the European Bioinformatics Institute and a pioneer in the use of computers to study protein sequences and structures, being one of the first to classify and describe them in terms of their component part. She is a fellow of the Royal Society, a member of EMBO Life Sciences, and a foreign associate of the US National Academy of Sciences. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. <laughs> so to start off with, may you give us a brief overview of your career? Um, yes, indeed. So uh, I started out um, as a physics undergraduate. So I did a physics degree. And um, from there, I had to choose a topic for my PhD and um, I went to the National Institute of Medical Research where I did biophysics um, and got entranced really with using computing so I, I learned how to program mm. and I enjoyed that challenge and um, the, one of the really nice things about the National Institute for Medical Research at that stage was that it had a computer system where I could look at molecules in three dimensions. So I could program the system to look at these molecules and make them turn round. Mm. And I was really sort of fascinated mm. by that. And so I got involved with that area and then I went on to Oxford to do a postdoc and really began to work full time on looking at protein structures. Mm. And I don't know if you're aware, but proteins have the most amazing three dimensional structures that are very beautiful. Mm. And um, they also dictate how the protein works. Mm. So without the three dimensional structure, no protein would be able to perform its biological function. And Absolutely. so this seemed to me to be really interesting to look at how these structures perform their functions. Mm. And I was very lucky because when I started, there were only about 20 protein structures. Mm. Now there are over 170,000 protein mm. structures determined. And so I've seen the field grow from being very small to being enormous and getting more and more exciting but if you like by the year um, yeah. and so I went from being a postdoc I went to Birkbeck College in London um, on a fellowship I was awarded a lectureship and then I moved to UCL to become a professor which mm -hmm. is just next door and I was very happy there doing my protein structure classification that you mentioned um, and then um, I was asked whether I would apply for being director of the bio of the European Bioinformatics Institute, which is just south of Cambridge. Mm. Uh, and I thought, well, this is quite a, an opportunity. Um, <laughs> well, I, I wasn't sure. I was very happy at UCL mm. and I have great collaborators that I still work with. But this was was a good opportunity. So eventually I decided um, that I would go and do this. And in fact, now I'm Emeritus Director. I stepped down um, a few years ago to return back to normal research, to mm. just being a research group leader. So today um, I've actually returned back to part-time work. I only work three days a week, um, but I do a lot of external things as well as my day job, if you like. Absolutely. Um, and so it's... Uh, Yes, I'm still doing my research. I still have a research group. Um, yeah. And that's the thing I love more than anything else, actually. <laughs> and your research has been huge. I mean, as you say, when you started, there were only about 20 protein structures known. And your work has completely, you know, increased this massively. And especially with the new technology that's evol evolving, um, that's really aided you in your research and across the field. Yes. But of course... I haven't determined the protein structures. I have used all of the data generated yeah. by the crystallographers and the NMR spectroscopists around the world. Mm. And so I've been totally dependent on all of their work to do 
my research, which involves not just looking at one protein at a time, but looking at many. Mm. So please may you tell us a little bit about your work on catalytic residues of enzymes and why this is important and what conclusions did you make from your research? Okay, so um, as you know, uh, in fact, for human beings, about 20% of all of our proteins, we have about 20,000 proteins and about 20% of them are enzymes. Mm -hmm. So we have four or 5,000 enzymes. And uh, these enzymes do the chemistry of life. Mm -hmm. Without the ability to do that chemistry, there wouldn't be any life at all. And in fact, having studied physics and not chemistry, mm -hmm. I, I'm not really the right person to study enzyme catalysis because it is hardcore chemistry, organic chemistry. But what we found was that the structures of many enzymes have been determined. So a large fraction, about 40% of the protein data bank where all the protein structures are stored are enzymes. Mm. And they are very well annotated by their functions. Mm. So we know usually exactly the reaction performed by each individual enzymes. Mm. And so we could begin to look at how that three-dimensional structure determines the function. And we looked, at first we started out very simply um, by annotating the residues in the protein, which were catalytic, which were involved in catalysis. Yeah. Usually it's only five or six uh, residues. So a protein, many enzymes are 300, 400 residues, mm. long, if not longer. And yet the, the part that does the chemistry is just in one little part of that enzyme. And so we used the information that was all stored in the papers to identify which were the catalytic residues. And then we did computational analysis to understand what each residue did mm. and why it was important. Because, of course, um, enzyme, well, catalytic processes are used widely in industry, yeah. but they're usually in organic chemistry. Whereas in the body, of course, mm. this has to happen at pH 7 or relatively close and um, at an ambient temperature. So the chemistry of life is very gentle. And so understanding how enzymes manage to perform these very complicated enzyme reactions is really interesting to, to try to develop new molecules that can perform catalysis under gentle conditions without extremes of pH or temperature. Mm. So we looked at these catalytic residues and what turns out is that actually the vast majority of these residues correspond to really just the six charged residues. You know, there are 20 amino acids mm -hmm. that form the proteins. Only six of those are charged and it's those six residues, well actually include and cysteine. Um, which includes the sulfur, which are the key catalytic residues. So proteins don't have a big catalytic toolkit. Mm. They really just have these few residues that are catalytic. And so how they work depends on how they're placed. So catalysis is a little bit like a complicated square dance or a complicated folk dance where every partner every residue has its role mm -hmm. and they're all positioned exactly to work so it is really like a dance or a complicated piece of music where you have to do it in the right order and it happens in the right way and that's what allow enzymes to really perform the catalysis mm. so what we're doing is trying to um, 
understand these catalytic modules in enzymes with the hope, I guess, of ultimately creating new enzymes that can perform new reactions. Mm, definitely. And you then went on to do some work on the mutation tolerance of these catalytic residues. So what did you find? Well, so actually I was quite surprised if you look at, so this is now looking at human genome sequences mm. and in particular for human enzymes and asking whether these catalytic residues are mutated often um, in, in your DNA. Mm. And what you find is that the catalytic residues are the best conserved of all residues in proteins. Mm. And, and that's very clear because they, they have to do a very specific role that almost no other residue can do. Whereas if you're just a residue that binds a molecule, many residues can be used to bind molecules, but only one or two residues can act as nucleophiles, say, as mm. part of the enzyme reaction. So um, what we found was that enzyme, that catalytic residues are the best conserved of all the residues, and that um, when they do change, often the enzyme loses its ability to perform the biological function that it normally performed. Yeah. In fact, there are things called pseudoenzymes. I don't know if you've heard of pseudoenzymes. These are, these are enzymes that used to be enzymes, but they've lost their ability to catalyze. And right. so they're called pseudoenzymes, but they've taken on new roles. So they do things like regulation rather than catalysis. Oh, so okay. this, happens, this happens actually quite commonly. So I don't know if you know, have you heard of um, kinases mm -hmm. that phosphorylation? They're very common. Yeah. Um, but there are about 10% of kinases are pseudo kinases. They actually no longer transfer the phosphate. Um, the kinases, that's what kinases do. Mm. They've lost that ability, but they regu often regulate phosphorylation. Okay, that's wonderful. That's so interesting. Um, yeah. So... My next question is moving on slightly here, but you used the uh, the metal MACIE database. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about what roles you found in, in the differences of redox inert metal ions compared to redox active metal ions? So, um, so we call it metal MACI, and this database was actually created by um, an Italian scientist, mm -hmm. uh, Claudia, who was visiting the lab, um, and she's a, an, or, uh, an organic chemist, inorganic chemist, and she actually developed Metal Macy while she was at the lab at, at European Bioinformatics Institute. Um, but then she took it back with her to Italy, and she works, she works in Florence, and she works on this in, in Florence, and she was the one who did the, all the analysis of the metal ions and what we, we saw. And we found that some, so um, I was, I was make, making it simple when I say there are only a few residues that perform catalysis, mm -hmm. because of course, the other side of catalysis is that metals are often used in catalysis because they are charged, very charged. Mm -hmm. And they, I think of them as the, um, they're like the, the bullet. They're, an, they, they're super powered mm -hmm. catalyst, if you like. And, and these um, enzymes, some of them, some of the metals basically are just there to stabilize the protein structure, whereas others are there to, to participate in the catalysis. And you can distinguish metals according to uh, the way the, their uh, ligands in, in the protein. So the ones that perform catalysis, if they normally have four ligands, will only have three ligands. Mm. And then the fourth ligand site will be close to the substrate of the enzyme. 
Um, whereas the ones that are fully coordinated often just for give stabilization, they're not directly involved in changing the, the bonding, the, the covalent bonding. Okay. So your work on protein protein complexes, can you tell us a little bit about what are the importances of these and um, what findings you discovered? So protein protein complexes are critical to almost every biological process actually. So we say, well, we have 20,000 different proteins in our bodies. Mm. And that's not very much. Actually, people originally, before the human genome was, was solved, thought that we had 100,000 proteins. So the fact that we only have 20,000, which isn't actually very much more than Drosophila, Drosophila flies, mm. they have 15,000 genes. Um, and even little bacteria have 5,000. So you could say, well, we're only four times as complicated <laughs> as the bacteria, whereas of course, when you look at human beings compared with a little bacterium, they're infinitely more complicated. And that complexity comes from the interactions between the proteins, basically. Mm. And so although we've got 20,000, of course, you've got 20,000 by 20,000 possible inter different interactions. Yeah. And so this becomes a much more complex scenario. So when we were looking at the, the interactions, and at that stage, this is now so many years ago, um, we didn't have that much structural information about which proteins interacted, nor about what their interfaces looked like. So proteins are generally globular, mm -hmm. and they interact through a face. So there are patches on the surface of the protein where they can interact. And this interaction can be extremely specific or it can be rather aspecific so that mm -hmm. it doesn't care which protein it interacts with. But many of the important interactions in proteins are these very specific ones whereby, for example, um, one protein, protein A, will only recognize protein B and it won't recognize any of the other 20,000 proteins. And so we were looking at those interfaces and trying to work out what were the important characteristics of these interfaces. Mm. And we found approximate sizes of the interface, which amino acids were involved, whether they were charged or whether they were hydrophobic. So we did a, a broad analysis of those, the, those interactions. Um, but I should say that then we had almost no data. Mm. Today, we have much, much more data. And also, it's very clear that not only do proteins form these um, bipartite, they interact with one other protein, but many processes in the body involve very large complexes with multiple proteins in them. Mm. I mean, the ribosome has obviously got not just proteins, but RNA as well. And these are huge complexes. And that was just the first of the really big complexes. But increasingly, we have the proteasome and the mitosome. We have different large complexes. Mm. Um, and these protein-protein interactions are, are often used to regulate the biological processes. Mm. So there's been a lot of work on, on that and it's still going on and the the huge um, technological progress in electron microscopy means that we can much more easily look at these large complexes now mm -hmm. they are they are amazing they are beautiful and they are very specific and they they are formed and they are dynamic so they form and they break and they work with other partners so this is like a protein protein dance mm -hmm. where they're all working together to form these complexes that do the functions that are required mm, absolutely and as you say hardly any data was around when when you were starting off with your research so 
1994, there were only nine protein folds which were known to recur in proteins, which didn't have a sequence or functional similarity. Um, and so what, how did your work on protein superfamilies help this? So you mentioned um, earlier before we started this recording actually about alpha folds and how AI came into this. So can you tell us a little bit about this? Okay, so, um, so I'll perhaps go right back to when we started, when we only had these 20 structures. And then when a new structure was solved of a protein, we would all rush to the library to look at nature or science and look at these structures and we just had pictures of them. But then the protein data bank was set up where these structures, the coordinates were held and they're made freely available to everybody. So mm. that was a huge step forward. But over the next 10, 20 years when I was working, we got more and more structures. So we ended up with 500 structures in about 1990. And it became increasingly difficult to hold all these structures in your head. Mm -hmm. And especially, you will probably know that if you think about cytochrome B5 and cytochrome C, to me as a physicist, they sounded like the same protein. Actually, they are completely different proteins, but they've just got the same or a very similar name. Yeah. And so it became apparent that we couldn't just rely on the names to cluster proteins that were similar. Mm. And one of the fascinating things about proteins is that their structures are conserved over very long evolutionary periods. So although the sequences can change, the structures are retained. So protein structure allows you to see farther back in evolutionary time to see which are relatives. And so um, in the early 90s, well, the 80s and the 1980s and 1990s, we realized that we had to, if you like, organize this world of protein structures. And so this, I, you know, I look back now and think it was rather similar to what Linnaeus and people like that did when they were looking at the plant world mm -hmm. because they looked at the plants and they clustered them into families according to what they looked like. So we were doing that but at the molecular level with the structures and we were clustering them and we could see which ones were related even though their sequences were very different. And so we created this uh, data resource that's called CAF which is still very much um, available today. And I did this work with Christina Rengo, who was my postdoc at the time. She went on to sort of own this and has run this ever since the early nineties. And it has grown as the knowledge of structures have grown, the classification has grown with it. Mm. Of course, we now have a lot of computational tools which allow us to cluster things together um, automatically. So that it's not just a case of looking at two plants and saying those two look alike or two proteins. Now we have the tools that will allow us to compare and give us quantitative measures of how similar those proteins are. And that was used as the basis of creating this classification scheme that we call CAS, the class architecture topology homologous superfamily. So we clustered proteins in different families and we gave them numbers to make it easier to deal with in the computer, basically. Um, and when we were doing that, we realized that some of these folds were much more common than we expected them to be. Okay. And so the distribution was, it wasn't that all the folds were there in the same number. Some folds just kept recurring, mm. um, even though their sequences looked completely different. And so we, we thought that these were the, the, we call them super folds. Now that, that picture has been modified as we've got more knowledge of the world of protein structures. Um, and we realize there are many variations that are possible on structures. 
And at some level it becomes, we, there was a, a big discussion at the time on whether things were continuous, whether the protein fold space was continuous mm. or discrete. I still think it's rather discrete because of the nature of the polypeptide chain, but within a group, there's quite a lot of continuity. So it's, it's sort of a mixture of both these things. Mm. Um, and so that, that was sort of us learning about the world of structures. But of course, one of the big challenges was also to ask the protein sequence of amino acid determines its three dimensional fold. So can we in the computer take the sequence and predict the three dimensional structure? Mm. So this was a challenge that was realized in fact, before the very first protein structure was solved, it was clear that there was a structure. Um, and so people were try thinking about the sequence structure relationship. And we, and we worked on various aspects of trying to predict structure from sequence. Mm. Um, and it became quite obvious that this was a very, very difficult problem. Mm -hmm. um, and after a bit, um, I'd seen various PhD students trying to solve this problem and really not getting anywhere with it. In fact, I saw many people around the world trying to solve this problem and not get anywhere with it. Mm -hmm. And some years ago, I decided I didn't know what I, I didn't have any really new ideas about what to do. Right. And in fact, the field, I would say there were gradual, there was gradual progress made from the mid nineties to about 2015, but the progress was very gradual. I have to say it was so gradual as to be disappointing. <laughs> and, you know, and I, I saw these very small changes in improvements in our ability to predict structure and they came at tremendous technological costs, the cost of developing these really complicated tools, et cetera. But new ideas, I think, were few and far between. Mm, definitely. And then um, in about 2016, the whole field of uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning began to emerge as being powerful. And people realized that the, these methods actually could improve um, our ability to predict protein structures. So <clears throat> in 2016 even, and then again in 2018, um, there were some efforts to use these methods and the predictions really got better, significantly better. <clears throat> and then in December, it was announced that uh, the company DeepMind, which is based in London, it's part of Google, they had been working on the problem <coughs> excuse me, for two years and they produced some brilliant predictions. Mm. Really, really brilliant. And <coughs> in many ways, they solved the, the protein folding problem. Mm. But they didn't use the physics and the chemistry. They just used these deep learning methods. Okay. So, <coughs> excuse me, I need to... No go. worries, don't worry. <coughs> so, <coughs> having seen that, it is really exciting because it means that we have millions of sequences. Mm. In, in Uniprop, the big sequence database, there are 208 million sequences. And if we include the metagenomes, the microbiomes, all of those, mm. there's almost a billion sequences. Wow. And yet we only have this rather small sample of protein structures. But if we can predict from sequence the structures, it opens up the whole world of protein structures. So we can begin to understand much more about proteins, the way they interact, and how they work, what they do. Absolutely. So this, 
progress from Arthur Fold is, I think, really significant and will change. I mean, it's built on, <clears throat> it's built on the knowledge of these 170,000 protein structures. Mm -hmm. so all that work to, to solve the structures experimentally is what's enabled um, the, the, the deep mind approach to, to solving the structures. So it's, it's really very exciting. Mm. So you mentioned the, the interactions between proteins and within enzymes. So can you tell us a little bit about the disulfide bridges in globular proteins and the work you've done on this? <laughs> so again, this is something that I did many years ago. In fact, it's so my disulfide paper, I was the sole author. That's the only paper I've ever written on my own <laughs> because all of the papers I've done collaboratively. <clears throat> but disulfides are um, links between different parts of the protein chain. So the chain is linear. It folds into a three-dimensional structure. And for proteins which are outside the cell, extracellular, they their cysteine residues, which involve uh, sulfur, hydrogen, they form a bridge between the sulfur and the sulfur, and that basically ties the, the whole structure together. So it's like on scaffolding where, you know, you can have struts that hold the whole thing together. And disulfides do that. They are, <clears throat> they don't occur intracellularly because the environment is, is um, oxidant, so, so you only end up with SHs in the cysteines, mm -hmm. it's only outside the cell. And of course, outside the cell, the environment is less stable. Mm -hmm. And so the disulfides really just give that extra little bit of stability so that the protein doesn't fall apart. Mm -hmm. And initially, it um, there were some suggestions for a short period that it was these disulfide bridges that determine the three-dimensional structure. Now, in fact, that's not correct. <laughs> the three-dimensional structure determines which disulfides form. Mm -hmm. At the time, that wasn't, that wasn't clear. Mm -hmm. And so I did an analysis of many structures, many proteins, looking at their disulfide bridges, and interestingly, <clears throat> uh, someone who became a friend and a colleague, Jane Richardson in the USA, at the same time, she was doing an analysis of disulfide bridges and we published our papers very, very close together. Um, and so it was, it was fun in those early days, there weren't very many people working in this area. Mm. And so um, it was great to, to, to be able to talk about what we found and, and what was important. So, um, and yeah, it still fascinates me how the protein can fold up into this beautiful three-dimensional structure. It does it spontaneously and it always gets the right answer, more or less, mm -hmm. not always actually. Sometimes it goes wrong. And of course, as you get older, it goes wrong more often. And that's what causes some of the diseases. Mm. But the, the disulfides are just part of that. They're like this additional stability tie that you mm. can put it to keep the structure uh, solid. Absolutely. So to finish off, may you just give us a, an overview of your most recent work? Well, I'll tell you about what we're trying to do. We've not succeeded yet, but we are trying to do. So, um, and it's about, well, there are several things, but um, this is particularly about enzymes where we started off with the catalytic residues. And what we're trying to do is to predict the mechanism of an enzyme. So if you know the structure, the mechanism is usually represented by what are called curly arrow diagrams. Mm -hmm. So this says, this residue does this, and then this residue does this. So it's this sort of steps. And um, some enzymes have three steps. Other enzymes can have 10 or 15 steps. It depends on how complicated it is. 
Mm. But what we're trying to do is if we know a structure, a protein, an enzyme structure, and we know the reaction that it performs, can we predict, based on our knowledge of all the other enzyme mechanisms, can we predict that new mechanism? So that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do in, in, in that particular field. Mm, yeah. That's wonderful. Well, that's all my questions covered. So thank you so much for joining us today, unless you have anything else you'd like to talk about. No, I, I'd like to thank you for, for your interest. I, I think if people can get engaged with this world, it's, it's wonderful to have been a scientist for me. I really enjoyed my career um, and I, it's hard work. Sometimes it's frustrating because things don't work as you hope they're going to work. But ultimately, it is one of the most rewarding things you can do. And so I would encourage anybody who's your age or older, who's involved in science, to really think about doing science, learning about how the world works, and especially in the life sciences. Mm. I mean, we, it's very obvious at the moment because of the COVID infection and the knowledge that we have gained about this little virus and how it works. It's still a problem. I mean, there's no doubt. But nevertheless, the vaccine has been, we hope, really the thing that will change the way we can deal with this, which of course is based on years and years of scientific work, mm. not looking at COVID, but um, at SARS-CoV-2, but at other viruses. And so the importance of really understanding not just human beings, but, you know, the whole, all the life on the planet, there's so much still to learn. I mean, we're just nibbling at the beginning. So there's so many things for somebody your age or, you know, your, your um, school friends and, and people at university to really, there's so many interesting questions to still to be answered there. Mm. So I just encourage you all to learn and enjoy it absolutely i can't wait to get into the field and do work <laughs> like you and yeah your, your work has been amazing and thank you so much for for this today and giving up your time i really really appreciate it so thank you my pleasure thank, thank you martha thank you thank you everyone for listening indeed